I would like to welcome everyone to today's CIBM seminar. Our speaker is Tim Grant, who's a fairly new faculty in the Department of Biochemistry and Morgridge Institute for Research. As a matter of fact, he started March 16th, 2020. And if any of you remember that day, that was the first day the university was closed two years ago. So he'll never forget that date. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about his background. Tim earned a BA in biochemistry from Imperial College in London, went on to earn his PhD in structural biology, also from Imperial College. And he was a postdoctoral fellow at the MRC, the National Institute for Medical Research in London. He did a second postdoctoral fellowship at the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute Genelia Research Campus in Virginia. And um, after that, then he became faculty here at UW-Madison. I just saw a little bit on how he got into this field. This was from his um, new faculty profile. When he was an undergrad in biochemistry, he took a structural biology lecture course. And the teacher was Professor Van Heel. And um, Tim really got into single molecule cryo-EM and ended up doing a um, research six-week rotation with a professor and went on to earn his PhD in that field. Anyway, thank you very much, Tim, for coming. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that was, uh, that six weeks turned into quite a long time, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. It's, uh, it's great to be able to talk to you. Um, so my research, both in my current lab uh, and the research I've done in the past has essentially been sort of divided into two very, um, very connected paths, one of which is the development of methods, uh, often very computational methods, for something called single particle cryoelectron microscopy. And I'll explain what that is in, in, a, in a bit of detail in a minute for those of you who don't know what it is. And then at the same time, I've spent a lot of time uh, working generally in collaboration with others to sort of solve uh, solve biologically important structures, hopefully answer uh, biologically important questions. And today I'm really going to focus on the computational side of things. I'm pretty much, or maybe not at all, really going to talk about biology. I'm just going to talk about some of these computational methods. I thought that would be a good, good fit for this seminar. Um, <clears throat> so what is a single particle cryo-EM? And in a sort of very basic sense, the goal of single particle cryo-EM is to take images of molecules, and here is an example of some molecules of beta galactosidase, and then ultimately end up with something that looks like this. So this would be a high-resolution three-dimensional model of beta galactosidase where we can more or less, with some degree of accuracy, know where every atom in that uh, molecule is. And the key part here is really this uh, black arrow. So you obviously have to go and make the sample, and uh, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of biochemistry. You have to uh, express and purify or other way, otherwise get the sample. But once you have it, you sort of spend a day taking images in the microscope, and then you have this black arrow. And this black arrow is basically all computation. So it's an extremely computationally uh, expensive and extensive technique. You do a lot of computation to go from these images to this. I like to give a very, very small amount of history in my talk, so I, I'm going to do that now. It's very brief. Uh, um, but if we want to do single particle cryo-EM, we need an electron microscope. And the electron microscope was invented by Ernst Rusker in 1931. And he invented it while he was studying for his PhD, which is kind of impressive, uh, makes me feel kind of bad about my PhD. Um, but he didn't build the first working prototype until after his PhD, so I guess that's okay. Uh, not until 1933. He won the Nobel Prize for this in uh, 1986, so it took about 55 years for him to win the Nobel Prize, and you can make an argument depending on exactly when you set that he did the work, that he was the one that, that took the longest between doing the work and, and earning the Nobel Prize. So we have an electron microscope. Electron microscope. What do we mean by single particle? So actually, from almost the time when Ernst Frisker had microscopes and he was looking at stuff, people have been looking at molecules, or at least large things like viruses. And at the time back then, 
This was done through staining. So this is a, a stained, stained images of TBSV uh, that were taken back in the 70s. You can kind of see these viruses quite nicely. And people have been doing that for years and years and years, but in the 70s, or in 1970, um, Aaron Klug's group basically took a number of these, in fact, only three, and used the different orientations to come up with a three-dimensional representation of what that virus looked like. And this was their, uh, this was their sort of three-dimensional answer. It was hand-drawn. This was all kind of done by hand. Uh, and in some sense, it doesn't look very impressive, but this was a, a key point in the development of the technique that I'm going to talk about. So the final thing we need is the cryo, right? So it's single particle cryo EM. And why is it cryo EM? And it turns out that from about the 80s, we've been able to dump the stain. Sometimes it's still done, but for the best images, if you really want to look at the thing you, you're, in, you're interested in rather than stain, you can freeze it. And so um, Mark Adrian and Jacques Dubachet they came up with this method of uh, essentially putting your solution onto the grid, making it very, very thin, and plunging it into liquid ethane. And then you get these layers of ice, and this is special vitreous ice. It's been frozen so quickly that it doesn't form uh, crystals. Uh, then you have your particle, and again, we're looking at viruses. A lot of work in early work in EM was done on viruses. Um, you now have this embedded in that layer of ice, and you can image the sample directly now. So anything you can get from this is sort of the true sample, not just a, a stained representation. I'll give you a very, very quick overview of to how we go about um, making our samples. So this is an EM grid. In real life, this is about three millimeters across. It's just a metal mesh, very thin metal mesh. This is it on the end of a pair of tweezers for scale. Uh, and these sort of square holes you see are just holes in the metal mesh. What we do is uh, take some of our sample that we want to look at. In the case that I showed you earlier, um, that would be beta galactosidase. So we have some purified protein, and then we put a small amount onto one of these grids that has a layer of carbon with small holes in it. And then we blot that very, very thin, just using filter paper, essentially and plunge that very, very quickly into liquid ethane. And that gives us this vitreous ice. Once we have that grid, we can sort of put it in the microscope and start taking images of it. This is just to give you a sort of idea of scales of how those images would look in a microscope. This is the overall whole grid. You see those little squares? Maybe you can just about make out those little squares. Those are the holes that I showed you before. If you zoom in on them, you get something that looks like this. Now you see little circles, and those are real holes in a very thin carbon layer on this grid. And we can go and start taking sort of high magnification pictures in those holes, and we end up with something that looks like this. So now we see, again, individual viruses, uh, and we can start doing things with those images. The reason that we need to do a lot of computation uh, on our images in single particle cryo-M is that the, our images are really, really bad. And the reason our images are really, really bad is that our samples are very, very radiation sensitive to the electrons we use to look at them. So as you use electrons in an electron microscope to image your sample, you essentially melt your sample. You completely blow it up. And what that means is we have to use very few electrons when we image, um, when we image our samples. And that is pretty much completely analogous to taking pictures in the dark. So this is the discovery uh, building. So this is where the mortgage is, where my lab is. And this is kind of like a standard picture that, that you would take. If you were to go and take this picture in the dark, uh, you've probably all seen this if you take pictures in the dark on your phone, you get this kind of speckled, noisy background. And that is uh, called shot noise or photon noise. And it comes about from the fact that you you haven't really generated enough statistics for each pixel to really know what that value is. There's this noisy uncertainty on top. Again, this is kind of like an increasingly long exposure. You start off with nothing. You start to see something, but it's very, very noisy. If you get a long enough exposure, uh, you see the thing very, very well. So you can think of this as taking a very, very long exposure or you can think of it as taking a lot of very short exposures and then adding them together. 
or averaging them. And actually, that's uh, equivalent. So if you had very, very noisy pictures of Einstein, uh, you had many, many of them. Each individual one would look very bad. There was very little light uh, to take those pictures. If you start adding those together, it's exactly like taking a longer exposure. And we essentially do something similar. We can't take many, many pictures of the same molecules. So what we do is we take, uh, we take pictures of many different molecules. And we assume, and this is an assumption that is largely not correct, and we have to do lots of things to uh, so sort of deal with that that I'm not going to go into. But for a first approximation, we assume that all of these molecules are the same. And so if we take one image of many molecules, that's the same thing as taking many images of one molecule. And we can start averaging them together. And so that black arrow I showed you is really, um, really just a process of finding things to average and averaging them together. The whole process is really just averaging. We can do that, uh, or we typically do do that in two dimensions to begin with. Uh, and that is because in two dimensions, all we have to worry about is finding things that go together. We don't have to worry about the relative, uh, the relative positioning of those different things. We're looking at particles that are embedded in a thin ice layer. And they can be, at least we hope, that they will be randomly oriented in that thin ice layer. And what that means is, oh, my pointer's gone funny. What that means is uh, we can't just go around and average these particles together. They're in different positions. They look different from different orientations. We have to group them. And we can do that in two dimensions. We can find things that agree, and then we can start adding them together. And here you can see how the signal greatly increases when we average these things together. Um, and so this is sort of better pictures of beta galactosidase. You can start to see a lot of features. Maybe on this screen, you can't see a lot of features. But you can start to see actually even secondary structure in these images, alpha helices, uh, things like that. The ultimate goal is to do this averaging in three dimensions. And here we have an additional complication, because in order to average three dimensions, we need to not only group things together, we also need to know what their relative positioning is, the relative positioning between them. Essentially, we need to have an angle for each of these images that describes the orientation of this object that we're trying to reconstruct. And so actually, a large part of what we end up doing in single particle cryo-EM is working out this angle so that we can finally, in the end, um, do this averaging and end up with this high-resolution three-dimensional structure. Um, that's actually a very involved process that I'm not going to go into in great detail. Uh, I'll give you the sort of um, quick and dirty description of how that's done. And that is to take a, uh, a model. You need some kind of model. And it can be largely wrong. It just has to be sort of a little bit right. And then you can start making, looking at what that model would look like from many different directions. So this is called projecting. You project it in many different directions. And then you compare each of your images each of these particle images to those projections, you find the one that fits the best, and you say, okay, well, this particle is probably that thing from this angle, and we can go and, and start averaging in three dimensions. And if you start with something that's wrong, you probably won't do that very well, but hopefully what you come up with looks better than the original one. And you can do this iteratively until you get to your sort of final high-resolution reconstruction. It's a reasonably computationally expensive thing to do, like I said. Um, you, you sort of, essentially, this angular, angular estimation process is what takes most of the time. To give you an example, this is uh, something that I solved a, a while ago now, but uh, the paper's just about to be submitted. Um, this is Chi-C. So uh, this is a protein that's involved in time regulation in some bacteria. It's kind of like a circadian rhythm for, for, it controls a kind of circadian rhythm in some bacteria. I always like to show this one because to me this looks like an hourglass. So this is a molecule that looks like an hourglass and is kind of involved in time regulation. So I think that's super cool. Uh, this it was actually pretty easy to process. Uh, 
uh, and it took about 7,000 CPU hours to, to do that processing, get up, uh, get to that, um, that final structure, which is you know, actually not that long. Uh, if you're looking at something more complex, it will take much longer. So obviously we do this on, on, across many different computers, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of computational cost involved. So uh, when I was doing my PhD, this was kind of like in the old days of single particle. I, I sort of started my PhD just before things started changing. So I guess in some sense I was, uh, uh, I, 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 did it, I, I joined at the right time. At the time, uh, very few people actually did this technique. And the re it was kind of known as blobology. So uh, a lot of X-ray crystallographers would basically completely look down on EM and say, well, all you can get is these low resolution blobs. We have no interest in it. This is a structure I solved during my PhD um, of a bacterial stressosome, so a, a kind of signal transduction hub. Um, and I solved this to seven angstroms. And this was one of the highest resolution structures that had been solved at that time. This actually got published in Science, uh, and a large part due to this seven angstrom resolution. Nowadays, you would not be able to publish this probably almost anywhere, because this would be considered to be very, very low resolution. So in, the reason that the things kind of changed was in 2013, um, Yifan Cheng, along with David Julius, published this structure of a TRIP channel, this TRIP V1 channel. And so this was relatively small, and it, they got a 3.4 angstrom resolution structure of it. So this was a high enough resolution structure that you could start to chase, start to uh, basically build an atomic model. Uh, and not only that, this was uh, a membrane protein. So uh, certainly at the time, membrane proteins were considered to be very difficult things to solve structurally. Uh, by cryo-EM, that is sort of much easier now. And this kicked off the uh, resolution revolution, the so-called resolution revolution, where people really started to take notice of cryo-EM, and a lot more people started to get into it. Um, in 2017, the technique essentially won the Nobel Prize. So Jacques Debuchet, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson, they won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for sort of early developments in the technique. So the question is, what happened in those few years to go from basically no one really thinks it's of any use at all to everybody wants to do it? And the answer to that was the invention of direct electron detectors. So before this point, everyone was recording their images on uh, scintillators, scintillator cameras. So the electrons would hit a fluorescent layer, create photons, those photons would be recorded instead of the electrons directly or people were using film, um, which was even, even worse. Uh, when I started my PhD, I spent 30 days scanning film. The first 30 days of my PhD, I spent scanning film. Uh, with these direct electron detectors, now you have detectors that will accurately record exactly where the electron landed. And that leads to much better images. This is uh, a plot of the detective quantum efficiency of various detectors. Essentially, the old detectors are down here. The new detectors are kind of up here. So you have simply much more information in these images than you used to get. And something that was very interesting to me and continues to be, and I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about it, was that these detectors were also based on CMOS technology. So that means they were very, very fast. And we could also take images as movies rather than just single images. And so I started my uh, postdoc with Nico Grigoriev just after these detectors kind of became available. And uh, I, I guess in many sense, it was a very fortunate position to be in. And so we started to think of ways that we could use particularly this new movie mode to get better results, get better resolutions, uh, improve our images, essentially. And the first sort of obvious thing to look at was beam-induced motion. So it turns out that when you put a sample in the microscope and you start to image it, uh, it moves. And actually, the reason for that motion is still poorly understood, but it, it's very clear that it does it. You may not be able to see it on here, but if you look at one of these viruses, uh, uh, the white circle should move, the virus does move. It's hard to see on here, but uh, if I show you this kind of average, it looks 
looks somewhat easier. It will, you can see it somewhat easier. So if you look at these viruses, this is what they should look like. This is what they tend to look like if you take an image of them. And they're moving. This is, this is just motion blur. They're moving in a certain direction, and you're losing information in that direction. And so we thought, well, now we have movies. Uh, we can very easily just align these movies and take care of most of this problem. Uh, and so we started coming up with a method and a program to do this. And it turns out that that is not as simple as you would think it would be, because the images that we get for individual movie frames are even worse than our terrible images to begin with. So I already told you that we're very dose limited um, in our images. Imagine now cutting that down by 100 or so. You end up with images that look like, that look like this. And you may think, well, you can't see anything on this screen just because the screen's really bad. But actually, this is essentially a binary image. The black you, black you see here has not even had a single electron hit it. There's no information in the areas that are black. The white areas that you see are, by and large, one electron. One electron has hit that area. Uh, and sometimes you'll find some pixels that have two or three electrons in, but it's, it's very, very rare. So these images are kind of like the definition of noisy. Uh, it's very, very hard to do anything with them. There, there's very, very little signal in them. So the question is, how can you reliably align these to get rid of that motion and recover this high resolution information? So we came up with a, a number of things. The, the first thing we did was to really focus on low frequency information, so the low resolutions in the image. This is actually the same image, just with all the high resolutions taken out. Now you can maybe just start to see kind of blobs in the background. It's very, very hard to see. But it turns out at lower resolutions, there is much more signal than there are at higher resolutions. So if you just dump uh, or largely filter away the, the high resolutions, this problem gets a little bit easier. The next thing we really worried about was we made this assumption that any motions that we see uh, will be smooth, or at least relatively smooth. These are very low signal images. When you start trying to align them, you get these plots that look like this. Everything jumps backwards and forwards all over the place. Uh, we make the assumption that that's probably not happening on the level uh, of things that we're looking at. And so we can sort of just smooth these. We use something called a, a savitsi gole filter to do that smoothing. Essentially, uh, that is just fitting polynomials to small, small regions of this data and then using those polynomial fits to, to recreate these plots. So you go from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. And this greatly increases the, uh, the sort of high resolutions from these images that you can recover. And the final thing we did was to do this uh, sort of slowly, iteratively, not allowing things to change very much round to round. And so we would start with, um, we would start with the unaligned sum, so just summing all the frames, and you get this blur. And then we start iteratively using these uh, different techniques, start trying to align the frames from uh, against this. Then we make a new sum, and we repeat that process again. So to give you an idea what this looks like on real data, here is uh, one of these viruses again, one of these rotavirus particles. And you can see that this is just the sum of the uh, unaligned frames. And this has a blur in this direction. It may be hard to see, but what you can look at is this. This is the Fourier transform of this image. And EMs have a, a contrast transfer function that I'm not going to go into. But what it means is they have this, this, uh, this transfer of information that in Fourier space is characteristic rings. You see these characteristic rings, and these should be symmetrical in all directions. So here they're not because we've lost information in this direction. It's been blurred out. And so you see if we just run this refinement after three rounds, I could flip backwards and forwards maybe. It's hard to see on this, uh, hard to see on this screen, but on the left we see some sharpening up of the virus. But you can also see that we start to see more and more rings. The rings start to fill in. And if we go sort of six rounds, now we've really recovered uh, essentially all of the information due to the motion in this image. So you have these nice circular rings. They go all the way to the edge. So now we've recovered a lot of high-resolution information in these images. And 
we essentially end up with much better reconstructions as a result. Um, so this, the, this sort of algorithm, this way of aligning movies, is we released this as a program. It's been used for lots of uh, reconstructions. And there are more uh, modern programs now that essentially do the same thing with some additional steps on top. So they sort of break up the image, do different things to different parts of the image. But this fundamental idea of focusing on the low frequencies, doing this smoothing, and, um, and doing this iterative process basically remains to this day for pretty much all motion correction in cryo-EM. So that worked out very well, and we started to think about what else can we do with these movies, with these new detectors that can improve uh, resolutions in cryo-EM. And this started uh, what, for me, became a kind of obsession with low resolution contrast. So uh, you'll see uh, some of the work that my lab does now, and I'll mention it very briefly in a moment. Uh, relies on this idea that low resolution and medium resolutions are actually incredibly important in cryo-EM. People tend to think about high resolution. They only really want to worry about high resolution. And of course, I worry about that a lot as well. But people tend to neglect the low and, resolution, low and medium resolutions. And this is a paper from 2014. It's a reconstruction of gamma secretase. secretase. And this really gives an illustration as to why these medium and low resolution resi medium and low resolutions are important for cryo EM. And what they did was they, they took two different data sets of exactly the same sample, but with two different cameras. And it turns out that these cameras were basically transferring high resolution information uh, just as well as each other. But one was much better at transferring low resolution information. It had these kind of low resolution contrast that was better. And people were not necessarily sure that that would help at all. But it turns out that only in that one where the low resolution information was transferred did they get a good reconstruction. And this makes sense from the perspective of this image processing that we need to do. We need to find angles for our particles. We need to find positions for our particles. And the low and medium resolutions are incredibly important for doing that. Once we've done that, all we care about is the high resolutions. But to get to that point, we really need that information. And so um, I'm a little bit obsessed about increasing low resolution contrast these days. And uh, some of the work in my lab is continuing on that. But at this time, we were trying to think of ways to increase that low resolution count. And it turns out there's a really easy way to do that. This is another image now of um, influenza hemagglutinin. And he's, here are isolated particles, just for you to see a bit more easily. This is taken at what was kind of the standard exposure rate at the time. So this is taken at 15 electrons per angstrom squared. So on average, uh, 15 electrons hit every angstrom uh, of this sample. And it turns out that if you just jack up this exposure to about 120 electrons per angstrom squared, you see those particles way better. I can flip between to give you an idea. So the, the contrast, it seems here, is much, much better. So you may ask, why were people essentially taking uh, images at this kind of exposure when they could have been getting images like this? And the answer to that is something that I already mentioned, which is radiation damage. So people for many, many years, um, since the 60s, had been measuring the effect of electrons on biological samples. And the way that they tended to do this was to stick uh, thin 3D crystals or 2D crystals into an electron microscope and start recording diffraction images. And when you first record that diffraction image, you get these nice diffraction spots to high resolution. This is something you'll see in X-ray crystallography if you're familiar with X-ray crystallography as well. As you expose them more and more, you start to lose these diffraction spots. The high resolution ones you lose first. This is kind of your sample burning away. And this tends to happen on average as an exponential decay. And so what you can do is uh, do lots of measurements, average them, and come up with a plot like, th plot like this. And what this plot tells you is uh, what your critical or um, optimal dose is for any given resolution. You kind of have a resolution at the bottom and exposure here. And 
this was done by many people on these crystals, and they found that typically around 15 electrons per angstrom squared was an optimal dose for certainly high resolutions, and in fact, most resolutions. And so people were sort of sticking to this 15 electrons per angstrom squared, because otherwise they were going to lose all their information. So the first obvious thing we thought was, well, now we're collecting movies. So we don't have to just collect at 15 electrons per angstrom squared. We can collect a long, long movie. And then basically by averaging different amounts of the movie, we can come up with different things. So we could average just the beginning of the movie and get this image. We could average the whole of the movie and get this image. And actually, that's what people were kind of doing at the time. Uh, it turns out there's a much better way to do this, which is something, uh, a process we came up with called exposure filtering. And it turns out, I'm not going to go into the, to the math of this, but it turns out that if you know the rate of decay for each of your resolutions, it's pretty easy to come up with a, a filter function that you can apply to each of your movie frames that will remove all the things that have been radiation damaged. You can then sum these together and end up with this final optimal image that has the best information at every resolution. So you don't have to pick from just having your low resolution or just having your high resolution. And so you, you end up with this exposure filtered image. This has this fantastic contrast, but um, it also has the high resolution information. It has not been radiation damaged. And so we basically did that based on the radiation damage measurements for these crystals and found that it didn't really work very well. And, and it seemed like the samples we had were f actually far more robust to radiation than the crystals that had been measured before. And so we set about uh, trying to measure this on a true single particle sample. So we had, a, uh, instead of using a crystalline sample, we had a kind of real sample. And to do that, we used something that was just very, very easy to solve. This is, again, rotavirus. Uh, it's very, very large. It has an amazing number of uh, this particular subunit uh, in each virus. So you can, you can get pretty high resolution reconstructions pretty easily. And so we did that. We solved. We took, uh, we took long movies with a lot of do dose. And we solved this structure. And we solved it to about two point, <coughs> sorry. 2.6 angstrom's resolution, which at the time was the highest resolution that had ever been got by single particle. Nowadays, there are atomic resolution structures. It's incredibly impressive. And then we could do things like just take some of the frames and make reconstructions from those. So you see if you take reconstructions from the sort of early frames, you see a lot of high resolution feature. As you start making reconstructions from later frames, everything is burned away. Uh, you sort of lose this, and you end up with this uh, just seeing secondary structure. It's kind of, you can see it burning um, due to the radiation. And this was a nice qualitative description of that radiation damage. But it turns out that you can actually do this very quantitatively, much like you do for tracking the, um, the, the, the fading of diffraction spots. You can use uh, what, what we use in EM to measure resolution to basically plot the signal-to-noise ratio of different resolutions uh, as a function of dose. And so we did this for many, many resolutions. And then we could make a plot that basically plotted our uh, critical exposure uh, over resolution, much like the many, many plots that crystals have been made before. And it turns out that if you line them up, they compare like this. So the crystal plots that everyone was working off of is this blue line. The line that we measured is this red line. And so for some reason, uh, and it's still not entirely clear what this is, the single particle samples are much less radiation sensitive at middle and low resolutions, actually. At high resolution, it sort of becomes the same thing. But at these resolutions, you can use much, much more dose and retain information. This is presumably to do with crystalline order. And, and you know, if you break the crystal up in various parts, uh, that's that becomes important for the crystalline diffraction spots, whereas the single particles don't really care about what's happening between them. But still, it's not entirely clear, actually. Uh, and so we used uh, these measured, th these measured uh, critical doses, this, measure, this measured radiation damage rate, 
to do this exposure filtering uh, more optimally. And uh, I might have to speed up a bit, but we confirmed this on some other reconstructions. This is an example of a 20S proteasome reconstruction where we took, uh, when this had been solved, people had just used different sums of the, of the movies. First, they would sum them all, and then later they would sum just the beginning frames. And so we looked at what happened with the signal-to-noise ratio when you did that. So this orange curve here is very, very low dose, and this uh, green curve here is very, very high dose. And what we're plotting here is signal-to-noise ratio. So you can see for very, very high dose, you have much higher signal-to-noise ratio at low resolution. But as you go to higher and higher resolution, this line's actually cross, and you end up with much lower signal-to-noise ratio at high resolution. The orange curve is kind of inverse. You have low resolution, low signal-to-noise ratio to begin with, but then you get better signal-to-noise ratio at the end. And this gray curve is our exposure-filtered curve. So this is optimal everywhere, essentially. We have the highest signal-to-noise ratio at all resolutions. And this uh, basically makes all of your processing better. All of these computational steps will now work better because you have increased signal in your images and you end up with um, much better results. And this exposure filtering is now basically done, um, is now basically done for all cryo-EM experiments. So this exposure filtering using these measured samples, measured values is done for all cryo experiments because it, it greatly increases the contrast that you have. So I will segue very quickly into some work that we're currently doing in the lab that continues uh, with my obsession of low and medium resolution contrast. Uh, and this is work that's being done by a great student in my lab, Gan Lee. Uh, and the idea here is that we're gonna be changing defocus. So I didn't really tell you about this, but, and you'll have to take my word for it, but in EM, our contrast comes from defocusing. It's a phase contrast method. We don't have a good phase plate. So in order to get contrast, we have to defocus. And this is a, a, a synthetic plot of what something would look like as you increase the defocus. You can see in the beginning, you see very, very little. There is almost no low resolution, uh, low resolution contrast in these images. Uh, but there is actually very good high resolution contrast in these images. As you defocus, you see things more and more and more. You get better low resolution contrast, but um, you do not have very good high, well, you have much worse high resolution contrast. And so uh, this is a, an example of real images. This is apiferritin. This is the kind of defocus you optimally would take your data at. And you can't really see the particles here. I mean, I can see them on my screen. You probably can't really see them there. Uh, and that is because we're so close to focus, there's very little low resolution information. This has great high resolution information, so in the end, if we can process this, we'll get a great reconstruction. If we just defocus the microscope a lot, we end up with images that look like this. This is four microns defocus, and now you see things really, really well. You can see the individual particles really, really well. Um, it turns out that we've thought, well, we've done this with radiation damage before. Why can't we do the same thing with defocus? So this is the, the CREOS. This is the sort of highest end microscope here in the biochemistry facility. And what we did was we wrote a program that could control the defocus very, very quickly on this microscope. And so what we can do is as we record the movie, we change this defocus. So we start up very close to focus in the beginning of the movie where there's no radiation damage and you have a lot of high resolution signal. And then as the exposure carries on and things essentially being burnt away, we can start to increase this defocus and start to recover the low resolution information. And if you time this all sort of correctly, um, you, can, you can get some pretty nice looking images. So this is a movie to give you a sort of an example. This is one of the earliest tests we did. So this is, uh, if I wait for it to start again, in the beginning, we're close to focus. You don't see much. By the end, we're very far from focus, and you get this really nice low resolution contrast. And what we can do is, again, we can computationally combine these things. So first of all, we have to basically run calibrations. And this is lots of stuff that we're kind of working on right now. This is not a finished, uh, finished result yet, but I thought I'd give you a sneak peek. 
And we can take these calibration curves. And this is just of carbon. So this is not a real sample. It's just layers of carbon. And you get really good signal from that. So you can track things really, really well. And what we can see is that if we repeat this many, many, many times, we get the same change in defocus. So this is very reproducible. Uh, where you start your defocus at is not reproducible. You have to estimate that. But what we can do is we can use this shape from the sort of calibrated off of carbon to fit the defocus for each of our frames uh, in real data. And there are a few other problems that I'm not going to go into. There are some distortions. Uh, there's like uh, different distortions that happen when you change the defocus so much. Um, essentially, again, we can calibrate these out uh, and we can come up with ways to correct them. And so this is a sort of standard apoferritin that is collected at about 0.4 microns defocus. This is one of our uh, defocus sweep apoferritins. So this started at 0.4 micron defocus. So it has the same high resolution information as this image, but now we have much more low resolution information and we see things much better. Um, this is essentially equivalent to a, uh, at least a defocused phase plate image. And so we've been running tests on this on sort of test samples. So we ran a test on apoferritin where we ran kind of a normal data collection and a, and a defocus sweep collection. And actually we found the defocus sweep collection gave a slightly better result, which was surprising to me. Uh, the main reason to run this test was to show that it didn't give a significantly worse result. Because it turns out that this is so easy to solve that uh, it shouldn't really make that much of a difference. The goal of this technique for us is to solve the structures of small proteins, where this medium and low resolution contrast uh, has much more effect. So we're sort of switching to very, very low, uh, low molecular weight proteins right now. Um, with, you know, uh, the dream is that we will get the, the smallest thing ever solved by cryo-EM using this technique, um, and that's ongoing work. Okay, I want to spend the, the, the last bit of this lecture talking about uh, another project um, that, I, that I did and started off in my postdoc and is ongoing in my lab, and that is the creation of this software package called System. So System... Uh, is a software package that system stands for Computational Imaging System for Transmission Electron Microscopy. And it came about through a collaboration of myself, uh, Nico, whose lab I was in, and Alexi Rohu, who was also in the lab, and he's now a, a Genentech. And what we had noticed is that basically through all the different methodological work that we had all been doing, we had steps for most of the processing uh, most of the, the whole workflow for single particle cryo-EM processing. So we thought, well, why not kind of join these up, put it into a nice interface, and have a program that will do everything? And that's exactly what we did. So we have uh, programs for doing this movie processing, distortion corrections, uh, CTF estimation. So this is one of the most used uh, CTF estimation programs in the field. And we sort of filled in all these steps uh, to get something that could go from movies to high-resolution three-dimensional structure all within one program. And this is what it looks like. We tried to encapsulate it in a nice user-friendly graphical user interface uh, with a focus on giving feedback to the user. So we all, we're always trying to present results in a way that you can sort of best judge how your data looks. And um, it turns out this is pretty fast, so uh, at, the, at the time this was the fastest. Nowadays uh, there is a commercial program that is faster than system, but still system is very fast. You can process that whole beta galactosidase data set that I showed you in under five hours on admittedly a very, very beefy computer. And it gets very nice results, so we can get nice high resolution, um, and, and things look pretty good. So this is a program that we've released, uh, and it's continuing to be developed in my lab, and a number of groups around the world use it, actually. But uh, I wanted to focus for this talk on just giving a couple of, uh, a little bit more detail on a couple of features that are in system that are kind of different from other programs. Uh, 
and, and how they work. So the first one is how do you go from not knowing what the structure is to getting your initial reference? And I kind of told you, well, you can start with a blob and do this iterative process and you will end up with the, the correct result. And it turns out that's not really true. Uh, for most cases, you get stuck in local minima. And so you need to do a lot of different things to not get stuck in these local minima. Uh, and this is various things that we do in system. Uh, we, again, focus on low resolution, at least in the beginning. Uh, we use sort of random subsets of the particles uh, so that every, every iteration is done with different data. Um, I'm going to focus on this non-greedy alignment, which turned out to be incredibly important for the result. But we do some other things as well um, that actually I don't really need to go into. So the, uh, the problem of this uh, alignment algorithm that I described to you is illustrated quite well here. This is a, a nice five-fold pore complex. And if you just do sort of iterative refinement on this, what you see is it all of the views go to one direction. It kind of makes sense because once you have one direction, and there should be five directions that look exactly the same. But if you have, once you have one that looks slightly better than the other, they will all go to that direction. And you end up with this sort of smeared mess where it looks good here, but it looks terrible here. And this kind of illustrates a problem with the, the algorithm that I described to you, where you, you get stuck in this local minima, you really overfit these problems. So we came up with this uh, sloppy alignment algorithm to kind sort of solve this problem. And what we do now is, uh, instead of taking the very best result for any alignment, we rank our scores for each, we align the data against all of our projections, and we rank these scores from worst to best. And then we say anything that is in the top 15% between these, we will randomly take one of those values. So in the beginning, when your model is very, very bad, uh, these scores will be really bunched up, and you will be randomly taking kind of any value, uh, any of the alignment iterations. So it kind of stops you focusing in on this, um, this very local minima. When things get good, these scores really stretch out. And there's actually, in many cases, only one, uh, one result that's in the top here. And so you start picking the very best one. In the case I showed you, because of this symmetry, there will hopefully be five in there, and you will randomly pick one of those five. Um, and so once you start doing this, you get a much better reconstruction uh, of, of this, uh, this symmetrical object. It looks good from all directions. And this is sort of systematic of, of avoiding these local minima. And it turns out this is key in doing this iterative refinement and going from a blob to uh, essentially the correct structure. So when you do this, um, you, you sort of go through starting from the blob where you just start with randomness and you start to kind of explore space where you find things that look kind of like your beta galactosidase but kind of a bit wrong. Normally you would get stuck in one of these, but if you start doing these, this kind of special alignment, you sort of improve things, you don't get stuck, and eventually you'll hit the right answer and get this nice uh, reconstruction. The other sort of uh, key thing that system had and, and nobody else had was uh, a way to deal with a problem that you often see in maps where you have limited, uh, where you have differential resolution. So this is illustrated really well when you have membrane proteins with micelles. So this streaky thing you see in these images is micelles. And you can see here, this is the edge of, the, of a detergent micelle. And because that micelle actually has no information in it, particularly by the time you average many millions of particles together, uh, this should essentially have no signal. The signal that you see is completely due to overfitting, uh, just matching signal that is not there. And so we came up with this system of being able to define where the, um, where the protein, the, the sort of the area that you are interested in, the area that should be high resolution is, and then we, we sort of weight these areas differently where we remove the high resolutions between, uh, between these two areas. Uh, 
but we keep the low resolution signal in these micelles. And that's important for sort of, again, this alignment process. This is a, a signal that you want to be aligning to, but not at a high resolution. Um, so system is uh, open source. It's completely free and available for people who want to download it and use it. There's a website. It has um, tutorials and, and tutorial data sets you can run through uh, if you want to try it out. Um, OK, I will finish there. Uh, I just want to acknowledge Nico and Alexi. So uh, a lot of the work I spoke about was done during my postdoc at Janelia in Nico's lab. Uh, and my lab here now in, uh, in the Moorgridge. So I, my students, Gan Lee, Pete Dukos, and Roma Broadbury. And this is my group. So thank you very much, everyone. Jim. So, um, in the earlier part of your talk, where you were talking about the sort of X and Y drift that happens during data collection, uh, how regular is that for a certain sample? Like, you know, what sample A of some protein always migrates in the same direction, or is it random in different parts of the grid? Yeah, it's, times? it's random. There is, um, it is not sample dependent. It is. Uh, kind of sample prep dependent. So there are ways you can change it. You can use different grid types, and that will reduce the motion. There are apparently now grids that do not have that motion. Um, so it's it's really a it's really what it seems to be is a, a a characteristic of the ice, not the sample. So the ice has some pent up strain, possibly relative to the grid. And when you put the beam on it, it semi liquefies again and it can move and that strain kind of comes out and that's what causes that motion. And the second question has to do with the higher dosage where you're starting to actually fry your sample. There's something analogous that can happen in crystallography as you point out and it tends to have a sequence dependence. So for example methionines, you can actually decapitate methionines um, as a function of data collection. Is there any analogous piece here where you could pull sequence information by looking for uh, uh, sensitivity of some portions of a molecule versus others, so you could actually start to say, that's a methionine, probably? Yeah, so uh, it's certainly, you can, you can look at this in the real maps and say um, the different residues, you can see that different residues behave differently. Um, in terms of the filtering, you, you can't really use that information very easily. But yeah, you can, you can analyze maps. In terms of using it to decide what amino acids you, you have, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of people who have done that. Um, I guess possibly you could do it. Um, you know, one thing, for, like in crystallography, disulfide bonds are incredibly radiation sensitive. And the levels of e that we have in EM maps, we're pretty much not going to see disulfide bonds. Um, so you can, you can kind of do that because, and really that's because, you know, char particularly charged amino acids, you tend to lose them very quickly in the EM. And so you can kind of use that to identify them. But yeah, I'm not aware of people who do it in a, in a regular basis. Anyone else? Owen. Excuse me if I'm just not quite understanding the math, and I'm sure people have done extensively about this, but it seems like a lot of the basis for this data analysis is sort of based on spherical and or globular proteins. Um, you're even talking about starting off with like a spherical blob to then get in that initial structure which you'll use for, for particle matching. So what happens when you aren't really dealing with globular proteins and perhaps extended structures? Or, or right, so I mean, if you, if you, if you're talking about actual globular proteins, you can get quite extended ones. Like that chi -C I showed, for example, is very extended. These things will work fine. If you're talking about helices, which I suspect you're thinking more of, um, then you can use tubes, basically. You can do the same thing, but you can start with tubes. What, what should be the image in my 
Yeah, I probably don't describe this very well. So um, I use the terms contrast and, and signal interchangeably, right? So, uh, and signal, signal versus the noise. So it's the signal to noise ratio we really care about. But the noise tends to be kind of constant, at least in any given set of conditions. So increased high resolution contrast just means increased high resolution signal, really. And increased low resolution contrast means increased low resolution signal. The signal's the same in both cases. It's just... The, the, you, what you're recording is the same, yes. So if you think of that as your signal, but I'm talking about the, re, the amount of recorded signal. You just talked about uh, why we are having an issue on charging residues. Is that part of the reason why when we're looking at those micellar structures, we are kind of losing a lot of that information? So the, the reason you lose those is because in every, every particle, the micelle is different. There's no consistency in the micelle, right? You have, the, you have a detergent, and those molecules are basically randomly oriented. So by the time you average them all together, there is no coherent averaging that happens there. All you get is this low-resolution blob that says, in general, there is a detergent molecule somewhere around here. But whereas, you know, if you do things in nanodisks, you get the same thing. But occasionally, you'll get bound lipids. So some of the lipids will bind. And then they'll be systematic, and you can recover those. Thanks, everyone.